Welcome, my name is Rachel Adams. I'm the Chief Curator and Director of Programs at the Bemis Center. Thank you so much for joining us today for Art in Practice, the intersection of poetry and visual art with Joshua Bennett and Cameron Shaw. I'm going to just do a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll and talk about Bemis a little bit, then we'll start. Um, just so you know, there are closed captions for this if you need them. Um, uh, the chat is enabled, so please chat in. We're actually really curious where you're joining us from. So if you wanna drop that in the chat, as well as any comments or questions that kind of come up during this, like feel free to use the chat function. Um, this um, image right here is actually a installation shot of Joshua's poem in our current exhibition, All Together Amongst Many Reflections on Empathy, which is a 21 person group exhibition that's been up all summer at Bemis and closes on September 19th. And this is part of programming with it. Um, so if you're in the Omaha area, please feel free to drop in to Bemis to see the show. We are open Wednesdays through Sundays. And, oh, sorry. Um, we have a few programs kind of coming up. Um, this Deconstructed Anthems program is actually this coming Thursday. It's live in person. We won't be live streaming it. Um, this is a performance um, created by the artist Ekene Ijeoma, who you see here, and performed by Dr. Brian Stanley. So this is a piece that's in the exhibition. So again, if you're in the Omaha area, please come at 7 p.m. And if you do miss it, we have a version of this performance um, that you can view on our Vimeo. Next week, um, right after Labor Day, we have a second Lunch and Learn with our community partner, the Great Plains Black History Museum. Um, the director, Eric Ewing, will be doing a talk with Preston Love Jr., who was um, instrumental in the Black um, Votes Matter movement here in Omaha. Um, so please join us for that. That's a Lunch and Learn, so it'll be on Zoom um, at noon on Tuesday. And then we are starting um, two workshops starting next week, um, September 8th and September 15th, sort of thinking again about the intersection of poetry and visual art for local high school students. So if you are a local high school student or if you know a local high school student that wants to do this workshop with um, some amazing uh, local artist, Devil Chris, who's a poet, and Sarah Rowe, who's an artist, visual artist, um, you can sign up. On our website, it's limited spots. So um, please um, get to the website really quickly and sign up and it's a free workshop. Um, and we'll be giving um, out Joshua's book to all the participants as well as lots of art supplies. And it's gonna be super fun. And then we'll create a zine at the end of the last workshop and we'll hand those out to people and scatter them around Omaha. Okay. Um, and then here are some more installation images from All Together Amongst Many. Um, so as I said, it's up until September 19th. If you aren't in the area, um, we do, um, like I said, we have lots of programming that's been happening throughout the summer. So you can kind of check those out online. And um, this show will be traveling to um, the Ogden, um, Utah area, which is a Weber State University in January. So if you're in Salt Lake area, you can check it out in January. We'll have more information about that as we get there. Um, and I want to, um, before we start, thank our sponsors of this program, um, Art Bridges, Humanities Nebraska, and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. Um, thank you so much for supporting this program and supporting BMS. And finally, um, we keep all of our programs at Bemis free. And that is thanks to obviously the aff aforementioned sponsors, as well as people like you. So if you're interested in supporting Bemis, um, please think about that as well. Um, you can go to our website, which is newly really redesigned and amazing and um, spend some time on there. And as I mentioned, please chat in where you're joining us from tonight. Um, we're really interested to uh, know where you are um, beaming in from. So I am going to stop sharing my screen for a minute. And um, Cameron and Joshua, do you wanna turn on? Um, and then I'm just, I'm, I'm going to mute, but I'm apologizing because my son is in the next room and he is just cracking up. Um, watching a show. So <laughs> anyway, um, Cameron, Joshua, do you want to turn on? Are you 
not able to. Let's try. Hi, okay, it says that I'm unable to start my video because I'm not the host. Oh, well, I'm gonna make you a co-host so you can do that and the same with Joshua. Sorry about that. Okay, try now. Here I am. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Good morning from Singapore, amazing. Um, well, I, you know, I have kind of stopped reading people's bios because I just feel like they're out there and people know, um, but maybe just both of you can kind of introduce yourself really quickly and then we'll kind of jump into the conversation so people are a little bit remembering and I'm gonna turn my, mute myself so Conrad's not laughing in the background. I think it's a beautiful way to start this program with the yeah. laughter of children, also knowing that Joshua welcomed a new life recently. So I think that's a beautiful way to start. Um, I'm Cameron Shaw. I'm the executive director of the California African American Museum, and I am zooming in from Los Angeles, California. Hi, everyone. And I agree, Cameron, uh, especially since my little one is asleep right across the hallway right now. So I'll, I'll probably go between my speaking voice and muted tones for the rest of the time. But my name is Joshua Bennett. I'm a professor of English and creative writing at Dartmouth College. What else? I hail from Yonkers, New York. I've written a couple books, one of which is uh, Ode. Oh, and I'm checking in from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm going to drop stuff in the chat so people, if they want to get a copy of your book or visit Cameron when they're in LA, I'll do you watch out for those links. Great. Joshua, can we start with a reading of America Will Be? Sure, sure. Uh, so the cover I just showed is an image of my father and I uh, that was taken back in 1992. I don't know if you could see I'm eating his macaroni and cheese and collard greens there. Uh, my mother took the photo, uh, which means penguin cutter a check, which is pretty cool. This poem, America Will Be, closes the collection. It is inspired by the work of Langston Hughes as an ode to my father, Bruce Bennett, who uh, was my first hero um, and is still the greatest in my mind. America will be. I am now at the age where my father calls me brother when we say goodbye. Take care of yourself, brother. He whispers a half beat before we hang up the phone and it's as if some great bridge has unfolded over the air between us. He is 70 years old. He was born in the throat of Jim Crow, Alabama, one of 10 children their bodies side by side in the kitchen each morning, like a pair of hands exalting. Over breakfast, I ask him to tell me the hardest thing about going to school back then, expecting some history I've already memorized. Boycotts and attack dogs, fire hoses, Bull Connor in his personal tank, candy paint shining white as a slaver's ghost. He says, honestly, probably having to read the Canterbury Tales. He says, eating lunch alone. Now I hear the word America and think first of my father's loneliness, the hands holding the pens that stabbed him as he walked through the hallway, unclenched palms settling onto a wooden desk, taking notes, trying to pretend the shame didn't feel like an inheritance. You say democracy. And I see the men holding documents that sent him off to war a year later, Motown blaring from a country boy's bunker as napalm scarred the sky into jigsaw patterns. His eyes opened wide as the blooming blue heart of the light bulb in a Crown Heights basement where he and my mother will dance for the first time. Their bodies swaying like rockets in the impossible dark. And yes, I know that this is more than likely not what you mean when you sing liberty, but it is the only kind I know or can readily claim the times where those hunted by history are underground and somehow still daring to love what they cannot hold or fully fathom when a stranger is not a threat but the promise of a different ending. I woke up this morning and there were men on television lauding a wall big enough to box out an entire world. Families torn with a stroke of a pen, 
citizenship, little more than some garment that can be stolen or reduced to cinder at a tyrant's whim. My father knows this, grew up knowing this, witnessed firsthand the firebombs, the clan, multiple messiahs, love soaked and shot through, somehow still believes in this grand blood-stained experiment, still votes, still prays that his children might make a life unlike any he has ever seen. He looks at me like the promise of another cosmos. And I never know what to tell him. All of the books in my head have made me cynical and distant, but there's a choir in him that calls me forward. My disbelief built as it is from the bricks of his belief, not in any America you might see on network news or hear heralded before the start of a football game, but in the quiet power of Sam Cooke singing that he was born by a river that remains unnamed that he runs alongside to this day, some vast and future country, some nation within a nation, black as candor, loud as the sound of my father's unfettered laughter over cheese eggs and coffee, his eyes shut tight as armories, his fists finally unclenched as if he were invincible. It's really powerful to hear it in your voice. Thank you. Yeah. Listening. I have to give that a minute, actually. <laughs> um, I want to start by talking about your father. Uh, mm. You know, the cover of the book, the first line of that poem, a figure who fit, um, looms so large in the collection ode. I'd like to learn a little bit more about the impetus uh, to write about family and the role of inheritance in your work. A beautiful opening, Cameron. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll start with inheritance. I mean, the title Ode is a, is a play on words, right? So on the one hand, I'm thinking about odes in terms of poetic form, the ode as a, a meditation or an extended celebration. And making it the ode, O-W-E-D, on the one hand, I didn't even realize this when I started writing these poems. It's a gesture toward June Jordan, who is a you know, hero of mine, the, the Black feminist, intellectual, uh, essayist, poet, right, anti-imperialist, who at the end of her life wrote odes, O-W-E-D. I think she had a pair of them. If you go to the end of her collected work, Directed by Desire, you'll find those. But when I first started dreaming of the poems in this book, I thought about them as small acts of reparation. And I thought about the, the spaces, the people, the everyday objects that have been den denigrated throughout the course of my life. And I realized that I wanted to celebrate them, right? If I was gonna make a contribution to American literature, I thought, you know, what better project than to take uh, these kind of intimate details and make them larger than life uh, through the lens of poetry. And so I, I was quite surprised. I sent Penguin maybe five options for my book cover and this is the one they came back to time and time again was just me and my father. And, I thought that was an image of, of incredible tenderness. And in some ways, it was just the deepest truth I know, you know, that I was raised by, you know, two people who grew up in incredible poverty. You know, my father is one of 10 children in Alabama. My mother is one of seven children in a tenement in the South Bronx, you know, where she slept on the floor and carried her viola at a Carnegie Hall, right? Um, and was pregnant with me when she, you know, pursued accreditation and accounting. And I just think a lot about what it meant to be raised in a family culture where ostensibly anything was possible, you know, where I was talking as a little boy about, you know, I was wearing Princeton sweatshirts because I knew that Uncle Phil from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air wanted to go to Princeton. So I wanted to go to a school like that. And no one ever said, you know, we've never been to Princeton. We don't know where that is. That's kind of a strange idea. It was always just about, you know, fine. You got to do really well in school though, if you want to go to a place like that. And anything I wanted to do, whether it was an academic pursuit or whether I wanted to become a paleontologist, when I wanted to train to become a minister, when I decided to be a full-time poet. Uh, my parents, you know, my older siblings, my younger sibling, they celebrated me. And um, we were a super tight-knit group. You know, that was the world I knew best. And so as a poet, I thought that's my first sight of witness. You know, these people that raised me and made me possible. There's so much in that, but I think we'll tease out over the course of the conversation, but I too was so struck by that homonym, ode, ode, uh, the everyday artifacts and experiences of life, particularly black life, mm -hmm. that in your work becomes something so grand 
you know, a trip to the barber shop, the do rag, ankle weights, the plastic on your grandmother's couch, the plastic on my grandmother's couch by, you know, the transitive property, just the connection there that I, I felt so, so deeply and so, so personally. Um, but yeah, this, this role that the quotidian plays is, is so in, incredibly beautiful in thinking about those, those small inheritance, um, those small things that we receive and are able to celebrate um, in the folks around us, even when they frequently go uncelebrated entirely. Um, there's something that I want to, to tease out about this poem as well, which is another major protagonist in addition to, I think, your family, which, which I identified in spending time with the collection Ode, which is literature, mm -hmm. language itself. Um, in America Will Be, you reference Lakeston Hughes, Chaucer, um, the, the quote, you know, pens that stab, the book that made you, as you say, cynical and distant. Language and literature figure as weapon, escape route, refuge. Um, can you talk a little bit about literature and language and how you're approaching that as a subject in your own work, both as a, as a poet and, and even as a critic, if you want to talk about that a little bit. Sure. Well, first and foremost, Cameron, I feel like we need you to blurb the next book because these close readings are, <laughs> are, are fire, as, as the kids say. Yeah, I, I mean, I've always been a, a reader. I think I always thought reading was transportive. You know, books took me wherever I wanted to go as a kid when the actual material world around me was difficult or seemed unbearable. I could open a novel, I could open the Bible, I could open a dictionary or a thesaurus and I could lose myself in the language. And I just thought that was a, a superpower. You know, I, I grew up in the Black Baptist church and when I would see preachers and I would see the effect, um, not just that their, their presence, right? But literally the idea of a kind of divine word had on people that they were uh, you know, doing somersaults in the aisle, falling out, running, speaking in tongues, right? The idea that language could do that, I just found astonishing as a small boy and then later as an adult. And uh, I mean, so much so that I got a PhD in English, right? I think you have to almost have a kind of formative childhood experience like that with language on the page to do something like that, you know, to even aim to spend 12 hours in the library somewhere. And so I think what I'm after as a poet, right? And one more quick thing on this. I never went to school for creative writing, right? I'm a, a self-taught poet, as it were. I really was, you know, um, in Firestone <laughs> with library at Princeton, just sort of going through the stacks, reading contemporary poets, reading poets um, from earlier generations and trying to teach myself how to navigate the page, right? Because my career started as a, a spoken word poet. I really was pulling from the preaching tradition that I grew up with. I was pulling from hip hop and uh, frankly, pulling from, from YouTube, you know, which really kind of blew up when I was in high school and college. And from there, I, I honed this voice that when it came to writing a book, I realized I had to try to capture that electricity or maybe not capture it, maybe how to set it free you know, on, on paper and paper and ink. So it, it'll always be in there, I think, that kind of bookish kid that realized that, you know, um, that works of literature were time machines, right? They could take you anywhere you wanted to go. And that it made you part of a, I'm gonna get a little abstract here, I hope this is okay. That's cool. So I felt like I was a part of um, what Michael Harper would call a continuum of consciousness when I would read, right? You, you kind of get plugged into the ancestors in a way where, at least for me, you can, it's almost palpable. You can really feel it when, when you're lost in a book. You can hear a voice echoing back to you from an earlier age. And I always thought that was quite beautiful too, that maybe that was something akin to this religious practice I was learning and what felt like these other compartments of my life. The idea that when you were sitting with a book, you were sitting with someone else's soul and you could, communicate back and forth that way, even if you were completely alone in the world or, or felt that way. So the beauty of that experience was something I just realized I wanted to share for the rest of my life. I couldn't think of a, of a better job and I couldn't think of a better way to spend my time. I promise the answers will get more concise from here on in. It's my first. Oh, I don't want that at all. I don't want that at all. <laughs> let's, let's relish in it. Um, no, the idea of the book as being transportative, you know, I was that kid, I still am that person with my head in a book all the time, writing my own stories, crafting my own worlds, 
you know, finding that way, that language, I think could become my superpower. I have um, a terrible memory, right? And that was something that I identified like really early on that I just couldn't remember anything. And um, I learned very early on that if I could articulate what I was seeing in the present, or I could become an interpretive force, a critical thinker, that I could regain some power that came from, especially being a kid who wanted to be good in school. But if you have a bad memory and you wanna be good in school, you gotta find some other way to like get to the thing, to get to the thing that can help you excel. Because again, I saw this idea that like, I could go someplace with my mind, I could get out of my neighborhood, I could get out of my city, I could go someplace my parents had never been with my mind, not only like, my imagination, but the force of my mind, right? That I could get into the schools, I could get into just the new experiences. So I, I do really understand that sort of language as superpower concept um, and had not necessarily framed it for myself in that way until you said it, but now I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. I feel that very, very acutely. Um, God, I could spend like a million hours. I feel like we could talk this whole time genuinely just talking about that one poem, but um, there are so many other things that I want to tease out. But before we leave the poem, one thing you right. talk a little bit about form and how you came to form as a poet. I'm, I'm curious that, you know, th this poem was blown up in an exhibition space. You know, it's alongside text based works like by Glenn Ligon, um, Marcus Fisher's visual and sound based work in the gallery untitled Words for Concern. I'm curious how the poem changed for you in any way in that context or by seeing it in sort of that new form, that expanded blown up form in the gallery space. Mm, it's a great question. After I answer it, can I ask you a quick question? Because I'm super sure. interested in what you just said about yeah. your academic experience and other things. Okay, how did it change for me? It was pretty cool. I mean, the only times people have asked me to have my work featured in museums, which is kind of an amazing thing to say, I guess, about one's work. Um, they've wanted sort of audio experiences or they've wanted video of me reading it. So the idea of the language just sort of having its own place amongst these other visual works I thought was really interesting. Um, and Rachel also asked me about the, the color of the backdrop, which I thought was so fascinating. So it added this completely other dimension I never considered to how the, the poem might move through the world, which is not just sort of black letters on a white page, but you know, this entirely other consideration of, of how color might bring it to life differently um, on someone's eye, right? So it's, it's been pretty sweet. I've looked at it a number of times on Instagram and otherwise. They've been great about tagging me in, in the stories and stuff so I can see how the poem is doing. I mean, they, there's also this sense, I think, when it's up in a museum, like it's a it's different than it being in the book, right? Like the poem, I, I consider a sort of part of myself and the idea of it being in a, in a museum as part of a kind of grand social occasion every day in a different way. I mean, that that feels like a an entirely unexpected way for people in, to encounter my work is what I'll say, right? Even different than a YouTube video for some reason. Uh, and, and the maybe, backdrop is blue in this case? Yeah, yeah. Blue. blue. Was that your choice? It was. What did it bring? Huh. What did blue bring? I don't know. I mean, well, I, I'm black, so blue brings all kinds of things. I'm thinking like <laughs> blues tradition, blueness, water, sky. I mean, I'm I'm super interested, as you could probably see in the poems too. I'm super interested in, in aviation. You know, I'm I'm completely taken with flight. So the idea of these poems is kind of um, and here I'm riffing on this poet Ryler Dustin, whose work I enjoy. But the the, the poem is are kind of notes I'm hanging in the sky for my father in that way, right? Like, look, Dad, I like pin this poem for you in the air. So I really like that idea, you know, that he could almost look up and see it. Yeah, I love that. Okay, can I ask you the question I was gonna ask you? Yes. So if you felt like perhaps one of the primary struggles you had in schools with memory, what drew you to museums? Which for me feel in one sense, at least at a metaphorical level, like memory, inst you know, instantiated, instituted, right? Like what are museums? Is that a reflection of our collective memory or what we deem worth remembering? I mean, that, that's super interesting to me. Um, well, I'll say two things. One, art history classes are really hard when you have a bad memory because early art history classes are just like artist, date, mm. <laughs> name of work. So I had to do a lot of cramming like night before 
because I couldn't hold on to that stuff for that long. And I still do like when I see like fellow critics or curators or art historians who can like really recall those same things, those like artist name date, I'm always like totally in awe of it. Um, but for me, it actually came back to that moment of critical thinking, that languaging superpower. I was in, I went to Yale, I was in the Yale Art Gallery and I was taking my first art history class only because I thought an educated person took art history and I was in a place where I could do that, right? And so I was like really getting into like what my educated self would do and she would take an art history course. So I took one and we were doing like our first close reading where we really had to look like carefully at a painting and describe it. And in doing that exercise, it was like someone switched on a light in my brain. And I knew I had to continue to pursue that feeling. And it was related to things I had experienced before. You know, my grandmother and I used to do puzzles when I was a kid. I still do jigsaw puzzles now. I do Sudoku puzzles. I, you know, like I, I have a, a puzzle master kind of piece of my brain. Um, and art history and close readings, I think, tap into that, like solving the puzzle of the image, the decoding, the symbolism, the context. Um, but yeah, it really, what brought me to museums was pursuing that feeling of having my brain switched on. That's beautiful. And it makes sense that you're such a gifted curator then, right? Because it sounds like what shifted that light on is your ability to make the past present, right? You could look at the, the ancient image and you see something immediate in it that you can draw out for people, which is a, you know, it's a unique talent. Well, it's funny because when I think about what my superpower really is, mm. when, when I articulate for myself, it's connecting the dots. Mm. Um, so for me, curation really is about connecting the dots, um, connecting one vision to the lived experience of another Yes. one vision of an artist to another vision of an artist the, you know like those are the things that I think that I'm that I'm connecting mm. and, it, and it gets to something that I actually want to talk with you about um place um do you mind if I read the opening quotes from the book okay oh please yeah, yeah, yeah. so we start with we are a nation within a nation a captive nation within a nation, which is James Baldwin. Their country is a nation on no map, Gwendolyn Brooks, and it is not down on any map. True places never are, Herman Melville. Yeah. So, I mean, in fact, we've got a little connecting the dots with you with those reference, but um, I wanna talk a little bit about place and America as, a place, a history, an idea. I think it figures really prominently in the collection, um, but also the specificities of New York City figure throughout the work. Um, so there's an exploration or, or maybe it's a tension between imagined place and lived experience of place. And I'm curious if you could kind of just tease out how you think about place in the work that you do. <laughs> yeah, this is so cool. It's such a good conversation. I mean, <laughs> I'm just really enjoying it. I mean, in part because it sounds like we think about art and praxis and in very similar ways that I, I just don't hear people talk about their work uh, this way. So, this oh, by the way, Joshua and I have never met. This is our first time <laughs> connecting. So you guys are watching us in real time, start to learn each other's minds. Yeah, it's pretty fun. It's pretty great. Yeah, I mean. Look, so I don't want to just throw like another quote of you off the bat necessarily, but you're also making me think about the kind of ghost line that doesn't start this book, but could, which is Derek Walcott, right? And he says, no nation, but the imagination. And I guess part of what I'm trying to tease out in this book is what do Black people mean when they say America, right? Because they mean a million different things, <laughs> right? And especially when I think about my parents and their vision of what America means to them as people whose families have been here for generation after generation, right? Hundreds of years, right? My, my family's been here. And what they mean by a certain kind of American optimism, I think is very different than the version of it that's critiqued um, publicly or otherwise now. And I was just super captivated by that, by what it meant for them to believe in a version of this place that had not been yet 
right? To bring it back to Hughes, but yet must be for their kids to be here, for the people they love to be there, for them to build a, a home here, right? That there must be another version of this country that was possible. And I just believe that relentlessly, right? My father integrated his high school. He fought in the Vietnam War because a recruiter told him that they wouldn't take his younger brother if he went instead. And then of course they took my uncle anyway, right? And yet, and still, <laughs> like, the man persisted. And this is at a 17 year old boy. He was thinking this way about kind of laying down his own life for the people he loved. And so that's the, the New York I'm from, you know? I don't know if you watch the versus battles, but you know, the locks versus Dipset uh, was the most recent one. And I had a real kind of existential conflict about that, you know? I'm from Yonkers. I went to church on that, that block where Jadakus had that beautiful sort of speech where he said, you know, I'm, I'm not from Colorado, you know, I'm from New York and I'm outside is what he said. You can come to my block and come see me. I went to church on that block. I went to middle school on that block that Jadakus is talking about. Um, but I love Dipset. You know, I, I had the big t-shirt in high school. I listened to that music. All of which is to say all of those New Yorks helped create me. You know, my, my grandmother had a salon and she had three salons in Harlem. And um, that's where I learned to love language. You know, the, the women in the salon, they would pay me a dollar if I said or spelled a word that was longer than three syllables, you know, malfeasance, loquacious, indubitable, this sort of thing. And so that's, that's in the book. That's all over all of my work is, you know, Harlem, the Yonkers, the Bronx. I mean, they're all pretty uptown too, right? There's not much about Brooklyn. Brooklyn makes an appearance in the book of Micah, you know, it gets its, it needs to get its due because it's a beautiful place, you know, especially the Brooklyn I remember uh, from my youth. But yeah, I'm, I'm always thinking about that kind of Black utopian vision, right? Black elsewhere is places like I mean, we, we were talking about Atlantica earlier, right? Because of the museum, right? Um, but I'm thinking recently a lot about Afrolantica, that sort of Derek Bell vignette and faces at the bottom of the well, which is this utopia that's defined by the fact that only black people can breathe there, you know? Like we can, we can breathe finally. They say there's like a heaviness removed from them, the characters in the, in the story. And I've just been thinking a lot about sort of black utopias. I've been listening to Sun Ra, thinking about what it means for that man to say he's from Saturn and, <laughs> you know, that this planet is doomed and that we got to go somewhere else. And even when I don't share that exact sentiment, the spirit of it speaks to me, you know, how can it not, you know, that there's, um, there's a place where our beauty can flourish, you know, and uh, believing that is what motivates a lot of my writing. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that April Bay show, Atlantica. Um, Folks, if you don't know who April Bay is, please go on Cam's website and um, check on our exhibitions page. Uh, she's created a beautiful vision of a place called Atlantica, um, which is a place where Black pleasure is not policed, um, where Black folk are accepted and loved for who they are as they are whenever, however. Um, and yeah, I think it's something that is really resonating with a new generation is sort of imagining these places that might be different than the world we are experiencing together right now. Um, a world that feels at times so heavy uh, with collective grief, collective pain. Um, so I, I do think there is something about these, these black utopias, these imaginings, these possibilities that is really calling to so many um, and has for so long, as you said, Sun Ra, et cetera, but that we're feeling that pull again and, and revisiting some of those, those visions and those voices um, re-emerging again. Um, I'm not gonna let you get away from Dipset though just yet because <laughs> something yeah. that I was, um, really struck by in reading your work was this question of legibility. Um, Ode is so rich with reference, whether that's August Wilson and Raina Maria Rilke or Trina and Joelle Santana. <laughs> Um, you know, and I, I think as we've gotten to know each other very briefly, like I think, you know, I'm a fellow black kid of a certain age bust out of prep school to, you know, Ivy League bound. 
that I really relished in these reference and their diversity and their spectrum and um, their non hierarchy also. Um, but I imagine many folk read the book and need to reach for their phones to look up either Rilke or Trina, you know, it, it could be either or. So I'm curious for you, who is the reader when you're writing? And um, I want to just talk a little bit about legibility, because I think even in Afrofuturism, I think there is this question of Black abstraction, of Black imagination, of a world that doesn't require a legibility of Black folk in the way that this world does require, right? Where this like condition of hypervisibility and invisibility that we inhabit as Black folk is not the constant, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about legibility or purposeful lack thereof and how that figures into your thinking. Yeah, of course. This is great. I'm so glad this is recorded. I'm going to run this back when my boy is old and this is how it's done. Yeah, um, it's a great question. I mean, so I'll start with my teachers, Gregory Pardlow, who told me to not be afraid to use all my Englishes. That's mm, how Greg put it. That's beautiful. Yeah, no, it, it knocked me out. And it was really helpful because I've been afraid to before that, right? And I appreciate that you picked up on the non-hierarchical nature of the way I'm deploying these references because I encountered them, you know, some would say out of order, <laughs> right? That actually I was super well steeped um, in Trina, for example, or Future, right? It also makes an appearance in the book uh, before I got to graduate school, right? And that's really where I started reading a lot of Rilke and Deleuze and Nietzsche, Foucault, et cetera, right? And um, for me, that stuff was interesting. You know, it was electrifying in its, in its own way, but it didn't draw me away from these other sources of, of knowledge and power and beauty. Before I did my job talk at, uh, at Dartmouth, you know, I threw on some dip set, you know, and I had that in the headphones and that was how I got charged up to go in there and do my 40 minute presentation. And it worked out really well, I'm really happy about that. But I can't imagine what else. And maybe if I threw on some Rachmaninoff, it would have been fine too. But I think <laughs> there's a particular reason that that music speaks to me and it spoke to me in, in that situation, which is that I needed that particular kind of charge, you know, to go in there and be my fullest, best self, you know, which is always going to be rooted in, in the music that helped raise me up. And, you know, some of that is, you know, that I went to all black preschool, I think, you know, I went to a school called the Modern School, which is founded by Mildred Johnson, whose uncle was James Weldon Johnson, who with her father, you know, Jay Rosamund Johnson wrote the Black National Anthem. And so before I even knew the Star Spangled Banner, to me, the national anthem was lift every voice and sing. That's what I sung every day while holding my sister's hand in this auditorium that was full of other Black children and Black teachers. And I mean, some would say that was a certain kind of utopia. But I was about to say that is a Black utopia. Yeah, I mean, that was the world to me. That was, so it was the most... It was the most normal thing ever that Black people did all kinds of stuff, right? We were scientists and janitors and lawyers and, uh, you know, people stole and people built, right? And people loved and they were complex, right? And they were philosophers. And in our barber shops, you know, people had heated debates about intimacy and basketball. And there were chess masters too who would like teach the kids to play. And it was an incredibly rich space that taught me to just think uh, in complex ways, you know, and to just believe that poor people were intricate and smart and, <laughs> and compelling, you know, at a literary level. And I'm not blurring those things, right? But I think I need to particularly name that I grew up around poor black and brown people because that's a distinct uh, group, <laughs> right? And, and it's those people's beauty that I'm largely trying to sing, you know, in this book. And that's the source of the work, you know, that's the creative source of the work. I'm never gonna relinquish my hip hop and soul and, and Motown roots because what would I be forsaking them for? Like what is more beautiful than that? Now that I've read all, you know, the, the great literature of the, of the Western world, you know, and I had to read all of that stuff, even just to pass my comprehensive exams, right? And, and get a PhD, you know, Aretha still slaps. That's still to me the apotheosis, right? Like what Aretha Franklin is, is up to, what Sarah Vaughn is up to, what Nina Simone and Sam Cooke are up to, and Smokey Robinson. That's that's what that's what I'm after, right? That is what Sylvia Winter said, right? She wanted to write the way Aretha Franklin sings, right? Like that's my pursuit, right? If I could ever write the way Otis Redding, David Ruffin sang, 
I'm out of here. You know, I'm, I'm doing that's, I'm doing something else. It's a different level of genius. So yeah, those, those are my mentors, you know, they teach me from a distance. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna go in a slightly different direction because this is something that I just was curious about and I haven't read this work of yours and now I very much want to, sure. but I wanna talk about animals. Okay. Um, because animal imagery appears throughout the book, you know, right out the gate um, in the first poem, um, Token Sings the Blues. Um, and you also recently published uh, being property once myself, um, which is a book of literary criticism that tracks blackness and black sociality, dehumanization and animal figures in the literary imagination. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about that book and a little bit about that thinking, because I think it's super interesting. Um, but I'd also be kind of curious to hear, we talked a little bit about this sort of movement of flow and form of ideas, but I'd be curious to hear from you how you think about your ideas moving through genres, whether that's poet, critic, academic, you know, how, how you're thinking about yeah. that movement of ideas. No, for sure. I just think they feed each other, you know, so being property once myself came out of the dissertation I wrote at Princeton while I was writing The Sobbing School, my first book of poetry. And then the sobbing school came out first, then being property once myself. And while I was turning the dissertation into a book, I started Ode. So for my entire career, I've always been writing sort of a, a work of literary criticism and a work of poetry at the same time. I just can't imagine one without the other. You know, I tried to write that book about novels and I, I did, but there's poetry in every chapter, either at the level of an epigraph or, you know, as a kind of book ending close reading you know, as I think about Richard Wright, Toni Morrison, Zora Neale Hurston, right, Jasmine Ward, uh, DMX makes an appearance, right, in the chapter about dogs. And so I've, I've just always, I don't know, I've, I've always thought about them as, as intertwined and inextricable, right? When I feel the language of the literary criticism fall slack, I turn to the poetry for life, right? So when I think about poetry for me, it's this, this ancient thing. It's like a kind of, um, it's where the divine comes into the language and snatches it up right, and does something unexpected with it. And that's what I'm after with the literary criticism stuff. I don't want it to be dry. I always want there to be a certain kind of swing to it and poetry really facilitates that for me. What else? I mean, that job talk I mentioned before, the first people to hear it were my parents. Like I read it for them before I read it for anyone else. And I always want my public lectures to have a, a real poetic sensibility to them because to me that opens it up to a wider public, right? They're always, I hope at least be an audience for beauty, you know. We started a little bit with family and something you said really makes me think about, you know, when you asked the sort of impetus for me, the trajectory of museums. Sure. Um, so one thing that I think has consistently factored into my museum practice and my curatorial practice outside of museums, because I did spend a, a, a larger, longer portion of my career outside of museums than I did in, um, is my mom. And mm. so like, um, my mom never went to college, uh, is super proud of me. Yes. And I spent this year writing this senior thesis at Yale that I was like, really, I really thought I was on, on one with that one. Mm. And I gave it to my mom. And my mom said to me, Cammy, I don't understand it, but I know it's good. Wow. And thank you for wincing because sometimes I can't even tell that story without tearing up, which yeah. is I said to myself, I am never going to write anything else that my mom doesn't understand. Hmm. I want her to say, Cammy, I understand it and it's good. And it's good. Yeah. So like that became my whole connection and direction in museum work was like sure. contemporary art as a lens for thinking about everyday experience, stripping down language, erasing jargon, getting to the place where anyone can come into the space and connect on some level and feel like any level they're connecting on is welcomed yes. and is correct, right? Mm -hmm. um, so coming back to family, how do your family read the poems? 
You, how? Yeah, like what is their response? In the crib? I mean, I, I, think they, <laughs> I think they like them. <laughs> I think they like them well enough. I mean, my, you know, my, if my mom has any smoke for the poem, she lets me know. And we've had those those conversations in the past too. You know, she's um, but she's been incredibly gracious. You know, my dad too. Um, they've left me a lot of room to try to tell the the truth of of my life through the poems, you know? And I try to clarify, I try to do the artsy thing where I say, oh, these are my speakers. It's not necessarily me, you know, it's a- Yeah, yeah, I wondered about that, sort of what was the role yeah. of autobiography yeah, I mean, that's versus play. imagination, you know, you it, it right. is so real, it reads so real, but I knew that, right. you know, real is relative. No, fair enough. But yeah, no, this stuff really did happen to me. <laughs> I, I want to defend that for my other poets who are like kind of, <laughs> or dreaming up something new that they're trying to articulate on the page, which I am. Um, but a lot of the kind of raw historical facts are, are mine and I'm trying to make music out of that. You know, for me, that's where the imagination comes in is, is trying to take the kind of raw autobiographical and, and make music out of it, which I think is a, a different kind of toolkit that's required for it. But yeah, my, my family's been super supportive. I mean, I got into poetry um, in any formal sense because of my mother. I mean, I think I was 13 years old Yonkers Public Library, and uh, they were hosting a poetry slam, and she made me get on stage. I've always had terrible stage fright, you know, um, and she made me do it, and I got second place. I have the trophy right here. I can show you if you, if you want to Please see Please do. It. <laughs> okay. it was, it was in my the fact that it's reachable says yeah. everything. Speaks well, no, so I'm in that phase of life where my parents are sending me everything from the basement. That was my- Oh, yeah, just get connection. it out of here? Yeah, so yeah, mm -hmm. second place poetry slam, Yonkers Public Library, but um. Yeah, so that, that was the start of my journey, I think. Because before that, it was just kind of sermons I would improvise after church and also uh, raps, of course, that I would keep to myself and uh, and short stories, you know. So I really started with kind of the, the flash fiction when I was four and five and in like some poems, but nothing like what I'm doing now, the kind of narrative sprawling work, you know. I think that really started through spoken word. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I want to leave a little space for questions. I see we've got some activity in the chat and I have not seen any questions pop through. So folks, please go ahead, drop your questions in there. I will keep asking Joshua things because I got things on my mind. Yeah. Um, I kind of want to do, oh, you, you have a question? I do. Let's let you. Let's, let's so, you well, I have a couple of questions. So one, I wanted to know what, because just because home has been a theme of our conversation so far, and given what you just said about your mother was so powerful, what does it mean for you to do the kind of work you do now at home, right? Like being in, in Cali. Everything, like everything. Yeah, I wonder. It means I, everything. Does any extra kind of pressure come with that? Or is, or is it freeing to actually be where people know you and have known you, right? Like you say your mom calls you Cammy, So there's a more familiar version of you that's not like the, Cameron Shaw that we all know and adore, right, in the public space that people see another side of perhaps, right, in your new role. It was really important to come home. And in so many ways, being at CAM in particular feels very full circle, right? To be mm. in Black institution, to be in a place that's not too far from the house I grew up in, mm -hmm. um, you know, within the area of LA where all of my family is from, you know, multi-generational LA. Um, that's really, really important. It's really, really important to me. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, before we got on today, we were talking a little bit about New Orleans and New Orleans is really the place that taught me to come home. Being with a people in New Orleans, post Katrina in particular, which is when I was there, that felt such a strong sense of belonging, a such strong sense of place and history that Black folk in particular felt that and knew their history and knew what it meant to have that place imperiled. Mm -hmm. I knew I had strong feelings like that for another place oh. and I had to go back to that place. And, you know, Art in some ways brought me back home too. You know, um, Kelly Jones now dig this, which looked at art in South Los Angeles, you know, black LA 1960 to 1980. That was the black LA of my parents. 
you know, what my grandparents were realizing came or did not come from the great migration and that choice. Like there was an LA that I was deeply a part of and I had to come home to that and being at CAM very much as being in that. Um, you know, CAM was founded in 1977. Um, so, you know, we're over 40 years old going on 50. And for me, I feel really connected to that, to that history of black LA. So being home is being home is big. And um, I came home in after being away for 17 years. And I can't imagine not having been here right now. You know, mm. I live a couple miles away from my parents, the house I grew up in, being to be so close to them during COVID, um, mm. tremendous and tragic changes in my family, losses, grief. Yeah. Being here right now, if I wasn't here, uh, I, I can't even like think about it. It's an awful thought. It's awful thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, I see a question. What, what's it like to make accessibility a main focus of curatorial work and writing, mm. especially over the past month, 18 months and change? Oh yeah, I'm curious, Joshua, this question came from Connor Delgado. Um, I'm curious about whether and how the work has changed over this last 18 months. Has COVID changed your process? Has the movement for Black Lives entering a new phase of visibility changed your practice? Um, yeah, let's talk about the 18 months in your work yeah, and important. accessibility also. Yeah, for sure. I mean, well, I became a parent during the pandemic, right? Which was one major shift. Well, I should talk about the major shifts in order. So when my grandmother passed at the top of the pandemic, which I think changed a number of different things for me um, in terms of just how I think about the importance of social life, of ritual, of family and folklore and shared space, and how much that single singular Black woman meant for the way I thought about just the role of language in my life. Like she just always had me immersed in it. Right. I don't know if this is familiar, but every family gathering, all the kids have to do something. You have to do a little dance you learned on, from TV or you got to do a poem. You got to sing a song. And I think that kind of practice just meant everything. Right. It wasn't even always about whether you were good at it. It's just you have to share and you have to get used to sharing. And some of us, you know, for neurological reasons or otherwise, might have a very difficult time sharing. But it was OK. Right. Like whatever you had to bring was good enough. And I think that was a quite powerful lesson. I think to learn as a, as a black child in America. So I also became a parent during the pandemic and that, that just changed the core of all my writing. Like it, what started as really just journal entries about my son and not being able to go um, to any of the ultrasounds with my wife, right? Up until the one, maybe two or three days before our son was born. And what that kind of distance in the midst of all these other forms of distance felt like. I also went to my grandmother's funeral on Zoom where I couldn't actually enter the, the, the church and, and say goodbye to her in that way. And so writing from the midst of all that alienation, I think really did change my process and my practice. And then once my boy was born, I just didn't write anything for like eight months, not a thing. Like I, I no poems at all. And that I'm shocked by how little that hurt in some ways, but like it's the being a writer has been at the center of my life for as long as I can remember, even before I was a professional. And one day I just couldn't really do it anymore because I had to take care of a small human being and I just didn't really miss it. And that was a revelation that there are things infinitely more important than <laughs> our professional endeavors. I mean, that maybe that's not a shock to anyone else. It's a shock to me. I've been very career focused since I was quite small. You know, I, I wanted to get a good job and be a good husband and a good dad. Like I was five or six years old, kind of dreaming of that. And what I realized at the moment that he arrived was that um, what that actually meant was focusing on love and life um, and not labor in that specific way anymore for a while. And so, yeah, all of that changed um, everything for me. How did it change it for you, Cameron? I'm curious. Well, the museum was closed for over a year. So I think thinking about how we connect 
to our audience, to our community. Um, that changed. I think that changed how we're going to move forward as an institution. Um, it also left space for thinking, right? It brought a whole new host of practical concerns and I'm a manager moving through remote work and all of those changes and people and their emotions and how complex this time is and how to be a leader and show up for people against the backdrop of this world. Um, like all these things brought real practical concerns, but it also opened up new space for thinking and there's some new kind of theorizing about the work that I was able to do and gain a sense of clarity on what we're doing. And one of the things that I think really came to the fore is like how we as a museum can more holistically support black artists and thinkers. Mm bringing revolutionary ideas into the world. And what does that mean? What does that mean financially? What does that mean administratively? What does that mean spiritually and emotionally to hold that and to hold space for that? Mm. Um, so that's something that I gained a lot of clarity on during this time. And I'm excited to see how the work unfolds over the next few years. I really feel like we're now entering like a five-year phase where some of the things that we got a chance to th think through together Mm -hmm. During this time, you know, they're going to start to to meet a public and be received and and, you know, hopefully critiqued and embraced and all kinds of other things. Um, so that's something. And then. Well, I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, OK, you talked about love. I want to just like do a little bit rapid fire as we're getting towards the end is um, what's a piece of visual art that you think of right now and feel moved by or that you loved? Oh my gosh. Um, I feel moved by, I mean, I'm just going to stick with it. Uh, Clotilde Jimenez has a, oh wait, can you see me? Am I frozen? No, I can see you. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm uh, listening. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, Clotilde Jimenez has this piece that's, um, hold on, let me pull this up right now. Oh, you're getting fancy. All these great pieces about boxing. I'm thinking about this. I'm sorry? I said you're getting fancy if you're going to yeah. pull something up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Shoot. Can I, I can share screen, right? Hold on. I can share screens. Yeah, this is the giant. Boom. Hold on. It's coming. But yeah, this has just been on my mind. It's called Standing Boxer. Hmm. Hold on. If I can do this in two more seconds, we're just going to let it go. But I've always, I don't know, this has just been on my mind for a long time, this particular piece. Hmm, I love that. I didn't actually have an answer to that question per se, but I did want to know what was on your mind. Okay. I'll just drop I, a link in the chat. Here. Drop it in the chat. I'm also curious what book is on your nightstand? books you can see these books <laughs> uh so i mean it's so funny i mean yeah of course i got roca letters to a young poet right here um but also this book american poetry observed poets on their work it's from the 80s but i've just been reading and rereading these beautiful conversations um just people talking about craft and i mean this is line from ws merwin here that stuck with me which is to paraphrase that a a poem is when a se sequence of words begins to pick up an electrical charge. And I just mm. thought that's gorgeous. Yeah, right? It, it really hit me. And then the last one I'll shout out is uh, Technical Difficulties, this book of uh, prose by June Jordan, which is just, you always got to mention June, you know? World it comes back to June. It, has it comes to, back to June. Has to. World historical intellectual, super slept on. What about you? What are you watching, reading, listening to, looking at right now that's moving you? Uh, well, visual art wise, I'm looking and thinking about April Bay a lot um, and her work and how it's unfolding. Um, book wise, I'm reading about grief. I lost my brother recently and I'm needing help, but I'm learning a lot in reading about grief. So it's powerful. And listening to, I'm listening to a lot of like soft nature sounds. 
Like I'll turn on like rainforest sounds or like oceans and just kind of mm. like meditate and chill out and quiet the mind. I love that. Do you like jazz at all? I do like jazz, yeah. Okay. There's this Bill Evans album, You Must Believe in Spring. Do you know this? I do not. Okay, I would check that out. Here I, we go. <laughs> Here like, we go. We like, share it now. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And the Stevie album, you know, the Journey Through the Secret Life of Plants, you know? Okay, okay. I, I really thought, I was like, oh, I got another one in my bag. <laughs> no, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about that. Yeah. Um, okay, on, an, on a very optimistic note, what is the thing you are most looking forward to right now? Uh, I mean, I feel like I'm going to be anti-climatic. I mean, my this little kid is like kind of talking now. I mean, he just, he'll go, ba, 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 and like, he has- A little the, jazz for you. <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, he's scatting, you know, from his stroller. I, I mean, just seeing him pick up the rhythms of speech, just new expressions. Now when he walks, he'll close his eyes for a little bit. And he'll just kind of run ahead. I mean, that that's just astonishing. Uh, seeing my little boy, August, right, named for the poet and playwright, but also for, for Black August, the kind of revolutionary commemoration of the life and legacy of George Jackson. Watching August grow up is just, yeah, that's the thing I'm most looking forward to. But what else? I'm working on some new books, you know, some new projects. Uh, a book called The Study of Human Life that should be out with Penguin next year. And then I'm also working on a cultural history of spoken word poetry. Um, and, and that's, you know, been a super exciting project, just trying to tell just this small sliver, this kind of 50 year history uh, about like the kind of New Yorican poets and Black arts movement poets and how their sort of sound becomes the, the vision of poetry slam and spoken word that goes global and goes viral and that we hear everywhere from kind of movies, right, like blind spotting in summertime. Uh, to these videos on on Facebook, you know, and World Star and YouTube with tens of millions of views. So that's been an amazing experience because spoken word changed my life. So I'm looking forward to that too, but not as much as raising my son because that's been a lot of fun. Well, we got something to look forward to as well then in these uh, new projects. Um, Rachel, I realize yeah. we are out of time. No, I mean, I'm just sitting here enjoying this conversation between you two and like writing down tons of things. So um, it's really been lovely. We had fun. Yeah. We did. Can we have a round of I wasn't applause worried. for Cameron as a host? We got to clap it up real quick. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Thank Joshua. you so much, Cameron. You're amazing. No, thanks so much for having me. And Joshua, thanks for being such a great conversation partner. I look forward to talking again soon, I hope. Same. I would love that. Are you great? Yeah. Thank you all again for joining us. And um, yeah, please just continue to see what Bemis is up to. We have lots more in store always. And um, 